for internal medicine residency. Uh, Dr. Lambiasi, our chair, couldn't be here today, but he wanted to extend his warm welcome to you and especially our speaker, Dr. Robert Four, who has been a partner and ally with us in graduate medical education for some time here at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine, Chattanooga. He has a wealth of experience uh, in medical education and especially how it affects hospitals and residents. And what he's going to present today aligns well with the month that we're in and exploring the other side of the physician-patient relationship and how it affects those around them and those that we take care of. So I'm going to leave the hour to him and I would hope that you would be able to stay, pay attention, and ask any questions. Dr. Ford. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here and talk with you this morning. It's a privilege to talk to internal medicine, but I tell you, every doctor in this hospital should be in this room today for what I've got to say and share and experience. We should have standing room only. But I do appreciate your participation, and I know that you'll be interested in this story. Um, please put your phones and beepers on silent. Let's not hear that and also save your questions for the end. I'm anxious for you to ask questions, but let's wait until I'm finished. Um, this is a story and I need to give you a little background. In terms of breast cancer, one of the statistics that's not on the screen is that the picture has not improved very much in the past 20 years or so. 20 years ago when this story was happening, 42,000 women died each year of breast cancer. I, I checked the, night, the 2019 stats yesterday to make sure I was accurate. And guess what? In 2019, 42,000 women die each year of breast cancer. So the situation has not changed. Now we in medicine, we like numbers. We live and die by data. How many is 42,000 women? Well, let me put that into perspective. 42,000 women is like having a 9-11 14 times a year. Let me say that again. 42,000 is like having 9-11 14 times a year. My wife and I went to the same high school, but we didn't know each other. This was in Jacksonville, Florida in the late 60s. After I got out of college, we got together and got married. What I did not realize or know at the time when we got married was that she would look out the window of her bedroom and look across the street, and that's where Audrey lived. And next door to Audrey was Pat. And next door to Pat was Mary Jean. And next door was Ann Lynn. All of these women were healthy, married, successful, had a husband, children, living a good life. And every one of them was diagnosed with breast cancer. And every one of them died two or three years later as if it was some kind of a predetermined schedule. Well, this had an amazing, awful effect on my wife's psyche. So to her, even though intellectually she knew that women with breast cancer survive, and many of them not only survive, they thrive, to her breast cancer was a death sentence. And if you got diagnosed with breast cancer, you were going to die. And she internalized this, and I did not know that. When we got married, she had a noticeable, palpable, visible lump in her right breast when we got married. And uh, that lump never went away. Now, Later on, jumping ahead another 20 years or so when our children were almost grown, now we find ourselves in Macon, Georgia. I'm associate dean at Mercer University School of Medicine. I turned to her one day and I said, do you still want to become a nurse? 
She always wanted to be a nurse because her mother was a nurse, an army nurse in a mass unit in World War II in Patton's Army, and she wanted to be just like her mother. So when this opportunity came up and I said, let's uh, see if we can get you in nursing school, she jumped on it. And she was an ideal student, straight A's, and became a wonderful nurse. And the lump was still there. I came home from work one day on a Thursday. The church bulletin always came on Thursdays. And I picked it up, and on the front of the bulletin was a message from our pastor named Tim. Tim was not only our pastor, he was a dear friend. He was my age, and he was my buddy. He was not this big authority figure. He was my friend. And Tim wrote on the front of the bulletin that his wife, Susan, had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Well, this was Thursday, and Sunday was coming up, and we knew that we had to go to church that day. But I can tell you I didn't want to go. I didn't want to face my friend knowing what he was going through. But we went, and we listened to the sermon, and we listened to Tim, and we hugged, and we left. And that was all we could do, is just say how sorry we were, and we'll pray for you. And I can tell you, and I'm sorry to tell you, but I was glad that it wasn't me. I was glad it was somebody else, because you see, breast cancer happens to somebody else, not to us. My wife, Rory, and I were getting along very well and it happens to other people only. Well, what I'm going to tell you today is really about breast cancer, but more than that, it's a love story. And I'm going to want you to go along with me and do some reading. So Rory says, under symptoms, that she went for a regular checkup and pap smear, did everything right, and the doctor said, no worry, you're okay. Now, I had hounded her for years and years and years. You've got to do something about that lump. The lump never changed. The characteristics were the same. And she would always tell me, well, when I go for my regular checkup, they tell me that it's okay. Don't worry. And so that was the story over and over and over. But then that lump inexplicably started to change. It started to get bigger and more noticeable. And we knew that something was really wrong. And of course, I was very angry as a husband. And I realized that anger and fear are very much the same. And I tried to get Rory to go to the doctor. There I was, an associate dean in a teaching hospital. She's a registered nurse working in the surgery center. I'm surrounded by doctors and residents and nurses and healthcare profession professionals all day long and I'm absolutely helpless. My patient is my wife, and my patient will not be compliant and do what she needs to do. She knew something was terribly wrong because this thing was changing before our eyes. And you know when you're in trouble, you start making bargains with God. And she would get up at 3.30 in the, in the morning in order to be at the surgery center before 6. And she'd go out to the mailbox to get the morning paper, and she would pray. And, of course, her prayer was, Oh, Lord, please don't let this be cancer. And, of course, God's, God always answers our prayers, not the way we want to sometimes, but God was saying, you know, you're my child, and I love you, and you have got to go see a doctor. 
So God was not successful, and neither was I. And the lump got worse. Well, God decided to try a different tactic, and so he sent me to an evening meeting one night, doctor meeting, and at the conclusion of the meeting, I noticed that uh, one of our former OB residents was there, Dr. Lures, and I said, Dr. Lures, I've got to talk to you. I've got a story, and I desperately need your help. And I told her what was going on, and she said, I'll handle it, and I'll handle it tomorrow. So the next morning, Dr. Lures went to the surgery center, pulled Rory over to the side in one of the exam rooms and talked with her and said, I've made an appointment for you to see me today. Now, you don't say no to Dr. Lures. So she went to see her that day. And Dr. Lewis had made an appointment for a mammogram, and we went right away. Well, we got to the radiology building, and we were concerned, of course, about her right breast because now the lump was very visible. A first-year medical student would look at her breast and say something is terribly wrong. And we were concerned about that, but they spent all their time on the left breast. And of course, it was bad news. It was bad news. I start thinking about the people that I should call and write to because I have to share this news, especially with family and some friends. I remember uh, it was new resident orientation within a day or two and we had uh, just gotten the news and I had to go to new resident orientation and give them all of these upbeat talks and encouragement knowing what was going on in my own personal life that day that was very 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 difficult well Rory and I wanted to get away uh, from all of this for a few days, so we went to the Gulf, and that was kind of like uh, our last trip. Because everything from that point on was going to be different. We didn't know how different, but we knew it would be different. So that was kind of closing the chapter on one part of our lives and opening another. We got back from our trip to the Gulf and the phone rang and it was Dr. Lures with the news. Our daughter, um, we, we then went to um, a surgeon, Dr. Paul Dale, who again was a graduate of our surgery program. We were so thankful because everywhere we looked, every doctor we talked to was either on the faculty or a former resident. So Dr. Dale had just come back from a surge oncology surgery residency in California, and he saw us right away. And uh, then we went to see the same day a plastic surgeon because Rory was so concerned about reconstruction and what all of that would mean. And then, of course, Dr. Dale said, this lump is so big, we need to, we need to go through chemotherapy first because it should shrink the tumor and that will make surgery much better. So chemotherapy started. I was so naive and so ignorant, I didn't understand this whole process of chemotherapy. I thought, well, what we'll do is we'll go to the doctor and there'll be a nice little private room there and she'll get hooked up to chemotherapy and in a couple of hours we'll leave. When we got to the doctor's office, it was packed with people. There must have been 30 patients there, and they were sitting in what I can only describe as easy chairs in a large room. There was a peculiar odor there, and everybody was hooked up, and everybody was very, very, very sad. It was like out of a bad movie. But I decided that I would go with Rory every time, and I did, and sat with her. And our daughter, Jessica, was there with us, 
and she would hold her Elmo doll with her. And the standard of care back then, I'm sure it's different now, but the standard of care was adriamycin, cytoxin, and 5-FU. And I sat there and I just could not believe that a human being could take in that much fluid into one body. I just did not know where it was going and how she could tolerate it. Well, um, the tumor did get smaller, and so it was time to schedule bilateral mastectomies. This was about in September. Well, I had the bright idea since our new life had already started and we were experiencing things we had never experienced before, I thought, well, maybe I should keep a record of all of this. So I encouraged Rory to do the same and we bought two little inexpensive notebooks from Walgreens and we started journaling. We'd write down things that we saw and things that we experienced each day. And after a few weeks, I knew that she was reading mine and I was certainly reading hers. And so I said, look, why don't I type up a little bit of this and type it into maybe an introductory chapter or something and let somebody read it and tell us what they think. And she agreed to that and so I did and I gave this to Sandra. Sandra was a nurse manager in the surgery center who had been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Her husband had just left her and she was continuing to work. So I gave this to Sandra and she read it and in a day or two she said, I think you should try to get this published. It was very helpful to me. So I was very encouraged and we started looking for a publisher. We, went to, uh, we wanted to do as much as we could for our lives to be normal. And one of our favorite entertainers, most of you are far too young to appreciate this person, but our favorite singer is Johnny Mathis. If you're over 50, you know who Johnny Mathis is. He's one of the greatest singers of all time. So we went to a Johnny Mathis concert at Chastain Park in Atlanta and all I could think about was my wife is going to have bilateral mastectomies. She's going to lose her breasts. She's going to have chemotherapy. This is very serious. All of this kept going through my mind and through my mind. And so I had a panic attack while we were there at the concert. It's hard to explain what that was, but it felt like I was having a heart attack, but I didn't have a heart attack. And finally, I started feeling a little bit better, and we left a little early from the concert, which ruined the entire night. But this was just one of, of several panic attacks that I would experience down the road. As I said, cancer is the great equalizer. When we went to chemotherapy, everybody was the same, everybody. Now she's getting ready for surgery and she's thinking about losing her breasts and all of those emotions that a woman can feel. She's already left her hair and I wanna talk about hair for just a minute because it's so, so important. And the loss of hair, I think, is something that doctors often don't appreciate. When she started uh, chemotherapy, as you saw, the nurse said, you will lose your hair and it will start coming out in 14 days. And exactly 14 days later, her hair started coming out. And so she said, in order to make this be less dramatic, I think I'll go get a very, very short haircut, which I recommend you telling your patients get a very, very short haircut immediately. Well, she came to work at the surgery center the next day, and one of the techs went up to her and said, 
what in the hell did you do to your hair? And then somebody else on the staff said, you should have never cut your hair. See, the day before she had this long, curly, beautiful, walnut brown hair. The next day she shows up almost bald. Which tells me that we need to educate people a little bit better when it comes to reacting to the physical change in people. If someone's physical appearance changes dramatically overnight, we need to understand that something is wrong. And we need to make sure we're careful about what we say. Well, she got her hair cut very short, and then she got into the wig thing. And she got several wigs, none of which worked for her. The first one was absolutely awful. It looked like she was uh, Loretta Lynn. And she said, this is not going to work. So she had always wanted to be a blonde, and this was her opportunity. So she got a small, short blonde wig, which was just the trick. And she stuck with that for quite a while. Well, we get to the surgery at center at 6 a.m. in the morning. She goes by to see her friends to tell them goodbye. She arranged with the surgeons to play a Yanni CD in the OR. She insisted on that. She loves Yanni and anything about Greece because she lived in Greece as an army brat. So they arranged to do that, Dr. Dale. Everyone in the OR was a friend. And, of course, I am extremely nervous. Our anesthesiologist was a great guy named Vince, and Vince said, well, do you want to come in the OR with me? And that really took me back. I wasn't prepared for that. But the only thing I could say was sure. So I got in scrubs and all of that and uh, went along with them and wheeled her into the OR, not planning on staying. There's, there's something I could not possibly have witnessed from beginning to end, but I went with them until at least she start, uh, went to uh, sleep. But it really struck me, I, being in an OR was not something I was familiar with, as many of you are, but this was a strange territory for me. And I couldn't help but think, think as she went uh, to become unconscious how it looked like she was dying because her speech got slower and slower and finally she was under. I had to be led out of the OR because I was, my eyes were full of tears and I really couldn't see. So when it was time to leave, one of the nurses walked me out and uh, then I could find my way back to her room. So I often hear cancer treatment referred to as poison, slice, and burn, obviously. And um, this is what Rory had gone through. There were 15 lymph nodes removed, and seven of them were bad. And so she went through uh, a period of time where she had very noticeable lymphedema. And I found again that doctors often downplay lymphedema, which is a huge problem for breast cancer survivors. Um, for some unknown reason that we've never been able to understand, her lymphedema has spontaneously improved over the years. The first year or two after surgery, it was very, very noticeable in her right arm. And now, unless someone actually pointed it out to you, you would not notice it at all. It has improved for some reason. During all of this time, we were both working in the surgery center. Rory was working full-time as a nurse. I was there every day. 
But then it's time for radiation, and I go with her again every time. She had 33 treatments, one every day, Monday through Friday. You get the weekends off to recover. And that was a wonderful day when that 33 became zero. Now, we think everything's over, but her oncologist says to her, after she's had chemo, after radiation, after surgery, he says, we're not finished. You need one more round of chemotherapy and it's gonna be Taxol. Taxol is very, very rough, brutal stuff. And of course, what did Rory say? She said, hell no, I'm done, I'm finished. I'm not gonna do this. Well, we all ganged up on her again and finally she said, okay, I'll do it. We can't go this far without doing what we have to do. So she underwent Taxol, and this was very, very rough and very difficult because her hair had started to come back. It was coming back beautifully, curly, thick, and now she was gonna lose it all again, one more time. So that was very, very depressing and quite a setback. Finally, it was over with. Everything was over. And we had finished writing the book. The book was unusual because every book I've ever seen about breast cancer was written by a clinician or a patient, but I'd never seen anything written by a husband and wife together, talking about the same thing from very, very different perspectives. Well, the book came out and I had had to go to a meeting in Washington, D.C., was flying back from the meeting on a Friday afternoon. I was exhausted and getting on. I, I think I was the last person on the plane. They closed the door right behind me. And I hate, to, I hate to travel alone because I always end up sitting next to somebody who was in deliverance or something. It was just horrible, uh, the people that I end up sitting next to. But I was walking down the aisle and I was looking for my seat and I couldn't believe it. This was a thank God minute. I saw this very, very attractive, professional looking young lady sitting right next to my empty seat. And I said, thank you, Jesus. This is great. And I sat down next to her and I was in no particular mood for chit chat. I don't usually do that. So I just said, hello, sat down, shut up. You know how you can get on an airplane and sit next to somebody for hours and then when, it's, when you're cleared for landing, you usually say, well, do you live here? A little light chatter. And you get into this great uh, conversation when you've only got a few minutes left. Well, that's what happened. We were cleared for landing in Atlanta. And I knew this lady was somebody. I knew she was in the public eye. She had to be an actress or she was on TV or something. And she turned over to me, thank, thank you very much, and she said, uh, do you live in Atlanta? And I said, no, I live it down in Macon. I have to go to Atlanta and drive down to Macon. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm the associate dean at Mercer School of Medicine. Oh, well, do you know Dean Skelton? Of course I know Dean Skelton. He's our dean, and he hired me. Well, he's a very good friend of mine. I interview him frequently. Well, what do you mean that you interview him? Well, I'm the health reporter for Channel 2 Atlanta. Oh, well, I'm sitting here talking to a health reporter in Channel 2, and I just wrote a book with my wife about breast cancer. Maybe I should mention that. So I told her, and she said, you know, she turned pale, 
and she said, I was diagnosed with breast cancer yesterday. And we're doing a breast cancer special in a few weeks. Would you and your wife like to be on that broadcast? And I said, of course. And she gave me her card, and I gave her my card. And darned if the next day or two we heard from Channel 2. And we were on that special. Well, what did we learn from all of this? There's always a lot to be learned. As I've alluded to, God is the greatest physician, but he sure does appreciate the value of a referral. You can pray and pray and pray, but God wants you to go see a doctor. And he wants you to go see a doctor who understands what hope is. He wants you to understand how powerful hope is when they've used all the chemo and all the surgery and everything in their arsenal, you've still got to have hope. We were so fortunate and blessed where we were because we knew who to go to, and maybe even more important, we knew who not to go to. So our doctors were absolutely godsends to us. Cancer is not an infectious disease. You can't catch cancer. It's okay to kiss a person with cancer. It's okay to hug a person with cancer. It's okay to make love to a person with cancer. It's not an infectious disease. Avoid doomsdayers. There's plenty of people out there who, when they find out you have cancer, they will be ready to bury you. We went to a high school reunion during all of this, and one of Rory's so-called best friends from high school had her buried. People were literally surprised to see her there walking around, and she looked great, and she looked beautiful. The way you look affects the way you feel. It's so important to keep your looks up and pay attention to your appearance when you're going through something like this. As I said, it's not the end of a sexual relationship. That's the biggest problem we have with husbands, and I've talked to so many husbands. Rory would work in the surgery center. She'd have a, a patient come in for a biopsy. The husband felt as though it was the end of the world and the end of their marriage. And she would call me, and I would go over and talk to that husband one-on-one. -on -one. Listen more, look more, love more. Needless to say, we don't have all the time in the world. You young folks, you think you may have all the time in the world, but you don't. Ten years, twenty years flies by. So you need to appreciate little things that are so incredibly important. And again, turn to faith. Whatever your faith may be, it's something that's going to be enormously helpful to you. It was a wonderful day when I got to get on the phone and call the church and tell them Rory's name had been in the circle of concern in the church bulletin for 49 consecutive weeks. And finally, I got to tell them to take her name off the list. Now, I've told you much of the story. There's a lot more to it, of course. But in the time we have left, wherever John is. This is Rory, Easter Bunny, enjoying life and enjoying her Chardonnay. And because she did so well, we were able to experience the birth of two beautiful grandchildren who live here on Signal Mountain, and then two years ago, we were able to rescue this little dog who needed to be rescued, and we were there at the right time and the right place. So now what I'm going to show you are some videos of some of those programs I was telling you about. What's going to happen is you're going to see some segments that are going to jump around from one to another, some local TV, some Atlanta stuff, 
and a national TV program. It tells the story quite well, and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. Breast cancer is snuffing out the lives of our mothers, our sisters, and our friends. That's why 13 WMAZ is launching an awareness campaign to stop breast cancer in its tracks. Tina Hex is live at Focal Point Women to show you how to be a friend for life. Tina. Ah, Frankie, speak the truth. This is Focal Point Women, a place where women come every day, thousands of them, to get their mammograms. It's been proven that self-help and education are vital in staying healthy. And that's what Friend for Life is all about. <laughs> A woman in the prime of her life. A nurse with a beautiful family and home. She's raised two children. Really a time when most women want to enjoy life. And that's what Rory was doing. Living life and loving it. Until the storms of life blew her way after biopsy results. They came back positive. Um, he scheduled me for some chemotherapy to shrink the tumor in the right breast before the surgery. I had three uh, rounds of chemotherapy over a period of about nine weeks. Then Rory Four had to face something even harder. And I had the surgery. I had bilateral mastectomies. As a nurse, Rory knows she has to travel that long road, hoping and praying, she says, that the cancer is gone. And as a nurse, she always had suspicions. And at one point, like many women in her situation, she knew something was wrong. I was in such a state of denial. You know, I had all kinds of ideas as to what this was. I had a virus, and I had a, uh, you know, a little infection that would go away. I even, I even got an antibiotic order from one of the doctors because I thought I could cure it myself. Rory says her husband, Dr. Robert Forrest, stands firmly beside her in the fight. But for this Mercer professor, it's still very hard for him to talk about what happened to the woman he loves. Well, it's, it's um, very difficult because what the husband thinks right away is serious, is it? And what are the chances of survival? And that was very difficult to deal with. But the fours have a message every woman should hear. A message about early detection. It's a message that can save your life. Be knowledgeable. Ask questions. If a doctor resents you asking questions, find another doctor. Be knowledgeable. That's the best thing in the world to do. And go get checked. The reason to go, the odds against you are frightening. If you've been putting off doing your self-breast exam or getting the mammogram you've been thinking about, listen up. 3,900 women in Georgia will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. Some of them will find the cancer early enough to get treatment. But the sad fact is that 950 women will die of the disease this year. Rory Forrest says her faith in God has allowed her to fight back. And she says that same faith brings healing. But out of the depths of her trials, she wants to be a friend for life. Rory says she's been face to face with fear. And that same fear can stop you from making a much needed visit to your doctor. Being a nurse, I kind of had suspicions, and then I would push them out of my head, and, and I kind of let things go a little bit too long. Despite what she's been through, Rory says she'll keep a smile of hope for a healthier life for herself and others. It's a woman with a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage for her to talk to us about that. We're here at Focal Point Women, and beside me is a quilt with the names of women who have lost their fight in, uh, against breast cancer, but we don't want any other women to lose that fight. That's why you see and hear more about early detection, whether it be on billboards, magazines, even television. 
That's because early detection can help you pinpoint the disease and hopefully get treatment. That's why 13WMAZ started its Friend for Life program. Tina Hicks joins us now with a special Friend for Life Thanksgiving story. Tina. Frank, one of my Friends for Life came to visit me a few days ago to let me see for myself how she was doing. The first time we met, I went to visit her, and she shared her struggles fighting breast cancer with all of us. I like this kind of story. You get to go back. Well, now she has a new lease on life and a new book about to be released. So meet the new Rory Ford. I think about that too every morning when I'm putting on mascara, I think. Isn't this just wonderful? Look closely and you'll see why this is wonderful. You see, today Rory Fora has eyelashes. When we visited Rory in May of this year, she had just been through chemotherapy and she had lost her hair. But now it's back. I know all the statistics, but only God knows what's going to happen with me. But right now I'm feeling wonderful, and my tests are all positive, and things are going very well. So well, she's had surgery to reconstruct her breast. Yeah. And there's also another project. We started writing a book, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have it accepted by a publisher, Smith & Helwes, uh, who are, are here in Macon. And we uh, finished the book in June, and it's going to be released this January. A survivor's guide to breast cancer is told by Gloria Nurse and her husband, Dr. Robert Four. Both share their thoughts and fears and tell you how you can survive breast cancer. And for a woman who survived the chemo and the radiation, it's good to hear Rory say this Thanksgiving. Well, hair is good. <laughs> I am so thankful for hair. And she's also committed now to being a full-time friend for life. And I would really like to go and be on Oprah. <laughs> also, <laughs> and talk to the country and go shopping on Michigan Avenue. We hope you do. Happy Thanksgiving, Rory Four. <laughs> If the editors didn't write me out, Rory tells me that I may just get an honorable mention in her book. Now, since she's had her mastectomy and the treatment, all her test results have shown she's healthy. We have a lot to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. When his wife was diagnosed with cancer, Dr. Robert Poor of Macon insisted they each start a journal. The result? A survivor's guide to breast cancer. We got the idea that it might be something that would be valuable useful for other people going through the same thing. Highly suspicious for cancer in the right breast, questionable area in the left breast. I can't stand the thought that Rory is probably going to have at least one breast removed. I hear the words I've expected for so long, but I'm still not prepared. I cry and Robert is fighting tears as he wraps his arms around me. In breast cancer, the husband is often the forgotten character in the play. Like Allison Hendricks, Rory Four underwent a double mastectomy, followed by breast reconstruction. Breast cancer, uh, no doubt, destroys many marriages. It's a huge strain on a marriage. Like Denny Hendricks, Robert Four says he drew strength from his faith. There was never an option uh, to, to do anything but, uh, but see this through. Allison Hendricks and Rory Four say they are lucky to have husbands who were supportive and stood by them. I have a couple with me that I think will both inspire you and also surprise you as we discuss their battle with breast cancer, which is something that we talk about a good bit on Good News. Every year in the month of October, we remind women of the importance of self-examination, going to the doctor, and so forth. And we have talked with breast cancer survivors in the past. Today's story is a little bit different because both of these people are health professionals and, and know all about uh, the medical field and what to look for and this, that, and the other. With me are Rory and Robert Four. And when I say your name, it just kind of flows together. Has anybody ever told you that before, Rory and Robert? Uh, yeah, it is. You just, kind of, you just go together. It just, it's just meant to be. You two have written a book called The Survivor's Guide to Breast Cancer, A Couple Story of Faith, Hope, and Love. And this book sort of chronicles a period of your life when, Roy, you discovered that you had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And once you faced up to that fact, the journey that you went on, both physically and spiritually, mm -hmm. 
which were definitely related. Definitely. And I know I myself got a lot of strength out of this book, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. First, let's tell our viewers, you're a nurse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know all the signs and symptoms, and I'm sure have persuaded people in the past, you know, you need to get your mammogram, you need to get your mammogram, you need to do this, that, and the other. But when it comes to taking care of ourselves, we're not always as diligent and persistent. Yeah. And that was the case for you, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, I had had problems with my breasts for years, from the time I was a child, really. And when things started going bad, I, I was in denial, and I tried to ignore it and push it out of my head. But there came a point where I had to face the music. Mm -hmm. And when I did, it was a huge relief. When registered nurse Rory Four experienced the telltale symptoms in her own body, she decided to wait until it was nearly too late. Reporter Sandy Engel brings us her story of struggle and survival. We were married in 1970, and as an immature 22-year-old, I thought about what could possibly be the worst thing that could happen to us in a marriage. And the worst thing in my mind would be that one day my wife would get breast cancer and have a mastectomy. And 25 years later, that's exactly what happened, except it was two mastectomies. I had a stage three tumor, which is very serious. It was very serious. Um, cancers, when they're at a later stages, have a tendency to pull in the skin or pull in the nipple. And certainly in Rory's case, that was, that was the situation. Rory Floor came face to face with cancer every day here in the surgery center where she worked as a registered nurse. But this time, Rory faced cancer from a completely different perspective. I had suspected that I had a problem for a while and, you know, anxiety ridden and denial and panic. Uh, there's so many, so many concerns that one has relating to surgical and medical treatment and the, um, the effects of all of that. Uh, we hear about, we hear about uh, breast cancer treatment often referred to as poison, slice, and burn. After 25 years of marriage, life was sweet for Rory and Robert Four. In June of 1996, they were finally in a position to build their dream home. And then breast cancer came into our lives. Shortly after Rory's diagnosis, the Four's battle against breast cancer began with chemotherapy. There was a distinct odor in there, and I thought, oh, I now have to come back to this place. I went with her every time and sat with her, and the nurse looked her in the eye and said, you will lose your hair, and it will start coming out in two weeks. And exactly 14 days later, we sat on the side of the bed and just cried because her hair was just coming out in clumps. It's something you can't control. You know, it's coming out, and you, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to be bald, and it's frustrating. After weeks of chemotherapy to shrink her tumors, Rory underwent surgery, a double mastectomy. I was fortunate to be able to go into the operating room with her. But it was um, tortuous to me. In fact, I had to be led out of the operating room because I was, I, my eyes were full of tears. I couldn't see to walk. I'm glad I was there to hold her hand as she, as she lost consciousness. But it was very painful. Following her surgery, doctors prescribed 33 radiation treatments over a six-week period and additional chemotherapy after that. All of these things are things that make you have to face up to it. All the, you know, the hair falling out, the surgeries, and the doctors, and the whole process, and it keeps slamming you. And so it's, it's, a, it's a constant trial. And just glancing at myself in the mirror, it was like, who is that? I was bald, I had no breasts, um, no eyelashes or eyebrows at one point. From the beginning, Rory turned to Jesus to help her cope. My response was, Jesus, just stay with me. And it was, that's when it started, minute to minute. And he did. I've always been a Christian, but I never had to draw on God like this. I'd have panic attacks at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, and i just pray to God to make me be calm, and it was instant. Every time Rory was in the hospital, I would find myself alone for a moment, or sometimes for hours. 
But I think that was uh, God's way of getting me alone so that he could talk to me and give me a great deal of strength. During Rory's treatment, the Forslo began recording their thoughts and feelings in separate journals. Their combined journal entries have now been published. In the Survivor's Guide to Breast Cancer, Robert and Rory write about the overwhelming support they received from family and friends and from their church. We had ma massive prayers going on and we could feel that. I'm sure that that was a huge part of what got us through this. I deal with cancer on a daily basis and telling people they have cancer and uh, it certainly seems to help the person cope with it better if they have a strong or good foundation spiritually. Robert and Rory were also helped during a church healing service. And I finally realized at that moment that there are many dimensions of healing. We all want the cancer to go away, but that's, that's not what God is concerned with. God is concerned with a much greater vision of healing. And I understood, again, for the first time, what blessed assurance means. And so that was a, a real wonderful and powerful day for us, that we knew that, that no matter what happened as far as cancer was concerned, that Rory was healed. Throughout her chemotherapy and radiation treatments, Rory was able to work. She suffered very little pain. I like to believe that God did this, um, because that's what I prayed for. I didn't pray to be cured. I didn't pray. I prayed just not to suffer. No pain. Why didn't you pray to be cured? Well, I really think I am cured. I mean, I, that's just something I assume. She has a very good uh, spiritual attitude towards this cancer, and I think she feels that she's cured of breast cancer, and as far as we can tell right now, she is. After completing her treatment, Rory underwent reconstructive surgery. Today, life is sweeter than ever. And guess what? Robert and Rory never let breast cancer stop them from building their dream house. It was as though God was leading us every step of the way. Everything worked beautifully. There were never any problems. And we, we ended up with a house that, uh, that I think in many ways God it's God. It's all God. And, and my wonderful family. I can't sell them short. It's, it's everything. It's all the prayers we've gotten. Um, but it's God. Okay, we've got about five minutes. I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Surely there's a question. The obvious question, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, where's Rory? Why isn't she here? Answer is very simple. Right now she's probably having her second cup of coffee of the morning, talking to our dog. She doesn't do this anymore. For about two years, Rory was in front of audience after audience, in front of cameras. She was the poster child of breast cancer. And finally she said, I'm done. She didn't want to be the poster child anymore. And so in 2007, we moved to Chattanooga for me to take this position. She actually worked for Erlanger for about a year as a nurse. She was at uh, North. But when we got here, she said, oh, thank goodness, nobody knows me. I'm not the poster child anymore. I don't have to do this anymore. And it was quite a relief for her to be free. She said exactly those words, now I'm free. So she is very, very happy anytime to talk to a breast cancer patient she still does. She gets phone calls and emails. That's her ministry. That's what she's glad to do. But she's not going to get up in front of an audience anymore. Makes sense? 
Anything else? Okay, I've got some books. The book is so old now. I hope, by the way, I hope you tell me that I have held up very well over the past 20 years. Hey, you haven't aged much at all. 